Liminality is the rhizomatic rootstock from which the radical movements of the far right and the far left sprout. This is a theme we've been exploring the past few months as we've been diving into the work of anthropologist Victor Turner and his model of society. In his work, Turner distinguishes between two overarching modes of human interrelation. He calls these modes structure and communitas, also known as anti-structure. In previous episodes, we've looked at Turner's account of this distinction, at liminality and the other types of anti-structure, marginality and inferiority, and most recently, we looked at how liminality is a better model for understanding the meaning crisis, the nihilism and the death of God. In this episode, we're going to look at the other side of this liminal equation. We're going to look at how Turner's description of liminality bears an uncanny resemblance to the leftist value system. Just as liminality gave us a rigorous understanding of the causes of nihilism and everything that comes with it, including existentialism and fascism, it also gives us a rigorous glimpse into the roots of the leftist value system. What we see is that the seemingly antagonistic camps of Nietzschean existentialists and far-right populists on the one hand, and the socially progressive far-left activists on the other, are in fact different shoots growing from the same rootstock. That rootstock is liminality. In the ritual process, Victor Turner explores the concept of liminality, a term originally coined by ethnographer and folklorist Arnold von Gennep which refers to the middle stage of tribal and traditional rituals. This is the true ritualistic phase when all the values of structured society have been dissolved and the participants are in a state betwixt and between their lives before and their lives after. In Turner's observations and study of the literature on such rituals, he mapped the contours of this liminal state. In the ritual process, he gives a comparative list of 25 differences between the properties of the chaotic, magical, ritualistic state of liminality and the mundane, hierarchical, everyday state of structure. These differences include communitas versus structure, unselfishness versus selfishness, simplicity versus complexity, homogeneity versus heterogeneity, equality versus inequality, absence of status versus status, absence of rank versus distinctions of rank, suspensions of kinship rights and obligations versus kinship rights and obligations, absence of property versus property, no distinctions of wealth versus distinctions of wealth, humility versus just pride of position, anonymity versus systems of nomenclature, total obedience versus obedience only to superior rank, sexual continence versus sexuality, it's worth noting here as well that this binary is a little more complex. On the one hand, we have the monogamous sexuality between husband and wife, versus on the other hand, we have either celibacy or orgiastic promiscuity, both of which are polar opposites of the measured contained sexuality of monogamy. Uh, nakedness or uniform clothing versus distinctions of clothing, minimization of sex distinctions versus maximization of sex distinctions, and finally, disregard for personal appearance versus care for personal appearance. There are many obvious correlations here already with leftist philosophy, but before we draw these out, let's first clarify what we mean by leftism in the context of this video. Drawing a definitive boundary around what is leftism and what isn't would be a fool's errand. There's plenty of disagreement around what does and does not constitute leftism. But despite the fuzzy boundaries, there are some movements and trends that are central to leftists. While some of the following may be popular among the more central moderate left, i.e. liberals, the base and origin of these trends comes from leftism proper. These include the more canonical core of leftism, which is the political and economic critiques of capitalism by socialists, communists and anarchists. This is the classical heart of leftism, but in the decades since Occupy Wall Street, this economic and political core has been de-emphasized. While it still provides much of the underlying framework, the public face of leftism today is displayed by movements such as Black Lives Matter and Defund the Police, the LGBT rights movement, feminism, multiculturalism and the environmental movement. Historically, we can see a pure embodiment of leftism in the suffragettes movement, the civil rights movement and the 1960s counterculture in general, from the Stonewall riots that gave birth to the Pride movement to the anti-war demonstrations and the European student riots of 1968. 
the unifying theme beneath all these manifestations of leftism is radicalism, a mistrust in the system, or as Turner would put it, the structure, and a belief that this structure is rotten and must be overthrown. With this definition of leftism in place, let's now converge our concepts of leftism and liminality. Immediately, there are a number of binary opposition from Turner's list that scream classic leftism. Let's look at Turner's list from the vantage point of the cornerstones of leftism. Starting with the economic slash political school of leftism, we can think of the values of socialism, communism and anarchism. Each of these schools of thought are utopian to some degree and dream of a world of equality rather than inequality, where hierarchies of status and rank are abolished, a world where all are joined in universal brotherhood and sisterhood rather than close-minded nationalistic parochialism. A world where property is no longer privately owned, but is either commonly owned or abolished entirely. In this projected society, there will be no distinctions of wealth, but all will be the same and return, free from civilization's structures of oppression, to our natural unselfish state where relations between us are spontaneous and heartfelt rather than tainted by the complexities of structure. Clearly then, the classical economical and political wing of leftism is almost an exact match for Turner's list. There are a couple of other observations we could add. For a start, when it comes to sexuality and the economic slash political left, obviously the sexual revolution of the 1960s counterculture would come to mind. But even more than this, we have the brief sexual revolution after the Soviets took power in Russia in 1917. There were regions in Russia at this time that tried to outlaw the privatization of women by their husbands. And there were calls for the end of the traditional family, which was seen as an individualist bourgeois institution. But as with so much of the visions of the Soviet revolution, it wasn't long before the liminality of the revolution gave way to a new tyrannical structure. We come across many similar stories in the history of the French Revolution. All of which brings us on to another interesting note. There's one of the binaries that stands out and challenges the conversion between this list of liminal properties and the leftist value structure. That is the binary of total obedience versus obedience only to superior rank. It might not be something that we'd expect in liminality, but if we return to the original liminal context, it begins to make much more sense. The tribal conception of humanity is as socially conditioned beings. In rites of passage rituals, we are molded into the form that our society dictates. This molding doesn't happen automatically key to this ritualistic process is the initiator or initiators. Just as the blacksmith melts iron down in the forge, destroying its previous form in the crucible of the furnace, before pouring it into a new mould, so the initiator breaks down the old form of the initiates and moulds them into their new form. The ritual is the forge, the all-powerful initiator is the blacksmith. The initiates in the ritual are totally obedient to the initiator. There is no question of the initiator's role or legitimacy. There is no questioning their punishments or orders. There is total and implicit obedience to the initiator for the duration of the ritual. As the concept of liminality has gained in notoriety, this core element of liminality has been conveniently overlooked. And there is something quite enigmatic in that overlooking. When we listen to the values of the left, the usual enemy is fascism. But fascism is merely the archetypal mask of the tendencies that leftism abhors most, i.e. authoritarianism and tyranny in all its forms. But, as right-wing commentators are fond of pointing out, wherever these leftist value systems have come to power, the result has not been utopian egalitarianism, but authoritarian totalitarianism. What leftist ideologies and far-right ideologies share in common is their radicalism. This radicalism seems to inherently require an all-powerful initiator. This element is more explicit in far-right radicalism, but seems to fly under the radar among their far-left cousins. Of course, the anarchists are well aware of this and invoke the example of the anarchist communities that formed and thrived in the Spanish Revolution in the 1930s. But such a short-lived example is not robust enough to serve as a counterexample. As we saw with the Bolshevik sexual revolution, even Soviet Russia experienced a liminal honeymoon period, but this post-revolutionary liminality soon gave way to a new rigid structure. 
There's much more gold to be unearthed in this direction, but for now we'll close off this train of thought by noting that even in this outlier, leftism's historical reality fits perfectly with Turner's list of liminal traits, even though its explicit values might disagree. Having looked at the connections between liminality and the economic slash political left, let's now turn our attention to its connections with the cultural left. By this, we mean the cultural emphasis which has come to dominate leftist rhetoric in recent years on things like LGBT rights and race and sex discrimination. Obviously, the core emphasis of these movements is on equality. We should all be treated the same regardless of our sex, gender or skin colour. The privilege of the patriarchy should be abolished and all should have equality. These traits are shared with the economic slash political left. But as we dig a little deeper, there are other items on Turner's list which were less relevant to the economic slash political leftism. Down at the bottom of the list we have minimization of sex distinctions versus maximization of sex distinctions. The relevance of this to the feminist movement is obvious. The same goes for the LGBT rights movement, but interestingly enough, in a different way. For feminism, we can read this minimization of sex differences as meaning an economic or cultural status of equalization between the sexes. But with the LGBT rights, this isn't simply a matter of economic slash political status. The pantheon of genders that emerged from Tumblr in its heyday don't simply point to an economic slash political reduction in sex distinctions, but to a breaking down of the walls of the structural concepts of man and woman. Those on the right parody this with polarised bad faith takes like Matt Walsh's documentary What is a Woman? But this is not the ungodly abomination as those on the right see it, but a manifestation of the liminality that underpins this entire movement. As the Danish sociologist Bjorn Thomasen puts it in his article The Uses and Meaning of Liminality, transsexuality or any form of transgender may be seen and experienced as liminal as is indeed claimed in postmodernist gender theory. Here, the liminal position is again turned into a vantage point of articulating diversity. See, for example, Mandy Wilson's article, I am the prince of pain for I am a princess in the brain, liminal transgender identities, narratives and elimination of ambiguities. Like twins in many tribal settings, transsexuality, whether that's transgenderism or intersex, is an example of permanent liminality. The social controversy that transgenderism has kicked up in the last decade and the unheard of concern with who uses what bathroom and who takes part in what sport bears an uncanny resemblance to the tribal concern with the categorizing of status and roles that we see in the work of anthropologists like Victor Turner or René Girard. The pages and pages of focus on the problems that twins posed for tribal status structures would have seemed alien to most people two decades ago but today it seems like a perennial human problem we are all too familiar with in the 21st century. The fact that transgenderism, quite often in spite of transgender individuals, has become the front line of the culture wars is in this regard quite suitable. It is the perfect embodiment of our liminal times. This is a completely different angle on liminality from that more popular on the self-actualizing right, which, as we've seen in previous episodes, is either reactionary, looking to get back to simpler and greater times, or nihilistic, spiritual or Jungian. Over there, the focus is on liminality as a cultural crisis following the death of God. Here, once again, we see that this explanation is too partial. While a whole book could be written on the subject of liminality and our current cultural moment, for those interested in reading such a work, I highly recommend the works of sociologist Arpad Shekolche. The purpose of this video was simply to highlight the uncanny connection between leftism and liminality. Putting this together with the previous episode on the nihilistic camp and liminality, we can see that there is something happening on a very deep level in the culture. Liminality proves to be a very helpful lens to look at this cultural moment through. Where nihilism, bloated with self-destructive self-importance, suggests that a veil of illusion has been shred forevermore and the horrendous naked truth of the world has been revealed by science, liminality tells us that the nihilistic crisis is nothing new. Instead of a horrifying terminus in which the truth has been revealed by Darwin or Newton, the crisis of nihilism instead appears to be a stage in the ebb and flow of value systems. Looking to history, we can see a parallel period in the Axial Age two and a half thousand years ago. As those societies emerged from the Iron Age into the Age of Antiquity, there was a chasm in their value systems. 
In this time we saw the emergence of Buddhism and the Upanishads in India, Lao Tzu and Confucius in China, the formation of the modern Israelite religion and the rise of Greek philosophy. Given that Stoicism, Buddhism and Taoism emerged from such a liminal period, it is perhaps not such a surprise to see them making a resurgence in this latest turn of the wheel of structure and liminality. Armed with the perspective of liminality, nihilism no longer seems like the bottom of the well, but just another spoke in the wheel of time. This doesn't mean we have to dispense with the nihilistic account, we just need to contextualise it. Nihilism is correct in diagnosing the death of God, i.e. the rug being ripped from beneath our Western value system. And it is correct in speaking of the dangers of our situation. Unlike the highly choreographed rituals of tribal people, our culture has no initiator unless you count the likes of Stalin, Mussolini and Hitler, and no clear signs of the threshold leading out of liminality. That's everything for this episode of The Living Philosophy. I'd like to thank David Pelabosian, Abyss of Fiesa, and all the other patrons for their support of the channel. If you'd like to get access to weekly bonus episodes, monthly Q&As, and get your name in the credits like these fine people, then you can head over to Patreon. As ever, if you have any thoughts, insights or feedback, I'd love to hear from you down in the comments. Otherwise, I shall see you next time. Thank you for watching.